Emiliano Zapata Zalazar was born on August 8, 1879, the ninth of ten children, to Gabriel Zalazar and Cleofas Hertrudis Zalazar, in the state of Morelos, in the village of Ananacuilco, which was one of the poorest provinces of all Mexico. In 1876, the years of turmoil caused by the upheaval of independence finally ended with General Porfirio Diaz coming to power. And although the fighting was over, Diaz's rule was one of a dictatorship. With no regard for the peasant class, Diaz crushed any dissent with brutal force, and the most fertile lands were given to the rich landowners known as hacendados. And in Morelos, this inequality was most severe. Most of the poor farmers who in the past depended on communal farming to eke out a living, but now they were left with the poorest soil that could only yield the poorest of crops. The hacendados took whatever they desired since the peasants were powerless to prevent them. Although the circumstances were dire for most, Emiliano's father was a skilled horse trainer. They prospered by the standards of the village, and Emiliano grew up into an excellent horse trainer, skills that would come in handy years later. This skill led him to be in great demand by the hacendados, which he found to be somewhat profitable. Shortly after he turned 17, both his parents had died. And considering the conditions of the peasant class, in 1897, Zapata took part in a land rights protest, which led to his arrest. He was drafted into the army, and after six months he was discharged. He returned only to find the hacendados anxious for his horse training expertise. This time he was paid handsomely. He rode in rodeos and races and provided his skills to those with the means to afford them. And although this did not make him a wealthy man, he was quite comfortable and he had gained notoriety and respect. Then in 1906, he turned his attention to politics. He started attending village meetings concerning the abuses of the land sieges of the Hacendados. An event that occurred in 1908 changed the political landscape throughout all of Mexico, practically overnight. Presidente Diaz gave an American journalist James Creelman an interview hoping to present his country in the brightest of conditions. And to also highlight his various achievements. But when Creelman asked what would happen when Diaz, who had been in power for over 30 years, would happen to retire. Diaz replied that Mexico would then become a democracy. Declaring that in 1910, he would resign and free and fair elections would determine his successor. He said he believed that the Mexican people were prepared to choose their own government in free elections, and declared that day had come. Pleased with himself he didn't realize the article would be published not only in the United States, but in Mexico as well. Now he found himself faced with having to follow through with his statements, and fearing that his powers as Presidente may begin to diminish right before his eyes. Now Zapata, together with other leaders of the village, decided to run their own candidate for state governor of Morelos, to replace the one who had just died. They took to campaigning, which led to a trip to Morelos, where they met with others to boost more interest in their candidate. The election for state governor took place in February of 1909, and to no surprise Diaz rigged the ballots. The new governor immediately raised taxes as a reminder to never go against Presidente Diaz again. Zapata realized that Diaz had no intentions of allowing free elections. But this did not extinguish his involvement in the resistance to Diaz's rule. In 1910, Zapata took a group of 80 men to the top of a hillside where the Hacendados had fenced off their property. There they tore the fences down in protest and were quickly branded as bandits. They then had to ride into the mountains to make their escape to avoid being captured. The mistrust and commotion caused by the results of the 1910 election among the peasant classes led to the start of the revolution. Diaz's presidency was in mortal danger of being ousted by the candidacy of the constitutionalist Francisco Madero. Madero campaigned promoting land reform, social change and democratic freedoms 
for the unprivileged people. He was gaining wide support throughout Mexico. So much so that Diaz had him arrested and jailed, because it had become clear that Madero was probably going to be the victorious candidate. Madero managed to escape and enacted an armed rebellion against Diaz. He published his plan of San Luis Potosí, promoting vague promises of land reform and other idealistic ideas, popular with the people. After his return to Ananaquilco, Zapata was elected as the president of the village council. He had gained the confidence of the village people and became a leading figure in the community. When the revolution began, he formed the Liberation Army of the South and became the leader of the Peasant Revolt in Morelos. Madero had already formed coalitions with the revolutionaries Pascual Orozco and Pancho Villa. Zapata decided to join along with his forces. During his first engagement Zapata's army captured the hacienda of Chinameca. Zapata's forces overtook Cuautla after six days of fighting on May 19, 1911. Things along the various battle lines were deteriorating for Diaz's army, it didn't look like the federal forces could possibly turn the tide of the revolution. That August General Victoriano Huerta was ordered to suppress the revolutionary forces in Morelos. With 1,000 federal troops he marched into Cuernavaca. While Madero sent his protest to the Minister of the Interior, Zapata demanded the removal of federal forces under the threat of the blood that the federal forces would suffer if they did not retreat from the city. Madero won the election. After becoming the newly elected president, Zapata expected Madero to fulfill the promises he had made in the plan of San Luis Potosí. Disenchanted with Madero, Zapata and Otilio Montano Sanchez fled to the mountains where they wrote a radical reform plan for Mexico denouncing Madero and outlining true land reform, titled the Plan de Ayala. The plan called for the return of all stolen lands under Diaz's regime. And among other provisions it required that rural cooperatives be formed, plantation owners to relinquish up to a third of their land to the peasants, and stricter measures enacted to ensure future ownership of the land. Very soon after gaining the presidency, Madero tried to send word to negotiate Zapata's cooperation. But Zapata was more interested in enacting his plan de Ayala back home in Morelos. Madero declared Zapata and his Zapatistas as bandits and ordered General Huerta's federal troops into Morelos to root Zapata and the Zapatistas. The Zapatistas pushed back, and now Zapata vowed to march into Mexico City and remove Madero. And to the north Pancho Villa, no longer in support of Madero, or his government began his move to push to Mexico City against Madero. Zapata, along with the large armies of Venustiano Carranza and Alvaro Obergon, joined the new revolution. The strength and determination of the combined forces superseded any defense Huerta could muster. After continuing losses on the battlefield, Huerta fled the field. with the revolutionary forces moving even closer to Mexico City. On February 9th, the nephew of Porfirio Diaz and the leader of a libertarian army, Felix Diaz, attempted a coup against Maduro with the backing of the U.S. government. Huerta managed to hold Felix Diaz's forces. However, Huerta saw this as an opportunity, he decided to abandon Maduro. And on February 17th, Along with the aid of the U.S. Ambassador Harry Lane Wilson, he convinced Maduro to surrender and leave the capital due to the insurrectionists trying to siege power. Maduro complied and what followed came to be known as the Ten Tragic Days. The fighting for Mexico City that began with General Diaz's coup continued for the next ten days between the opposing forces of Huerta and Diaz. The artillery bombardment and rifle fire killed many of the civilian inhabitants along with major damage to the city itself. 
Then while attempting to flee, Maduro was captured by the libertine general Aureliano Blanquet, and Maduro found himself again imprisoned. On February 19, Huerta and Diaz met with Ambassador Wilson to settle their disputes in a formal agreement known as the Pact of the Embassy. Maduro, was convinced that he would safely be allowed to leave the country in exile, was taken from his cell on February 22, only to be assassinated on what he believed was his road to freedom. Huerta then proclaimed himself the new president, backed by many of the Mexican state governors along with the support of the United States and Germany. But the murderous coup and killing of Maduro shocked the peasants of Mexico, and a new civil war broke out with many of the northern and southern revolutionary armies taking up arms to oust Huerta. The newly inaugurated President Woodrow Wilson refused to recognize the Huerta government. On April 21, 1914, he sent troops to occupy the city of Veracruz. Huerta, fearful of an American intervention, was forced to withdraw his troops from Puebla and Morelos. He attempted to enlist Zapata to unite with his forces to defend Mexico. Zapata refused, and with the front weakened by the departure of most of Hutra army he captured Hohutla that May from the remaining federal forces. Many of whom decided to join his rebel army along with their guns and ammunition. By the summer of Zapata's forces had advanced to the southern edge of the federal district, prepared to march against Mexico City. The constitutionalist forces of Carranza, Obergon and Villa had advanced on the federal district. With the encroaching approach of these combined forces Huerta was forced to flee. Huerta found himself with his regime dwindling before him. He was now powerless against the revolutionary forces closing in around him. Then on July 14, he formally resigned the presidency and fled the country. Carranza, Obergon and Villa captured the federal district. The constitutionalists signed a peace treaty, established a new provincial government with the backing of Wilson and the United States. Carranza became the first authority of the nation. Zapata and Villa were both left out of the negotiations due to their progressive ideas, Carranza, being an aristocrat with many political alliances, considered them both uncultured and nothing more than peasants. Zapata and Villa both opposed Carranza by creating a popular front against the constitutionalists. Carranza, through an envoy, proposed a compromise, hoping to avoid conflict with Zapata's Zapatistas along his southern flank. In doing so, he could concentrate on defeating Villa. In his response, Zapata demanded veto power over Carranza's decisions. Carranza immediately rejected his demand, and that was the end of any negotiations. Opposition to Carranza had spread widely, the people were hungry for reform. This was primarily in Villa's state of Chihuahua in the north, and Zapata's state of Morelos to the south. In October, Carranza called for a meeting in Mexico City with other of the revolutionaries, called the Convention of Aguascalientes. During the convention Carranza's supporters lost control of the proceedings. The other revolutionary forces called on Carranza to resign his executive powers. They appointed General Eulalio Gutierrez as president in November of 1914. With Mexico City still under the control of Carranza's forces, the civil war resumed. Obergon aligned with Carranza, while Villa and Zapata moved separately onto Mexico City. In December, Zapata's forces were first in the taking of Mexico City. Overwhelming Carranza's forces with an army of 20,000. Carranza, along with his forces evacuated the capital to Veracruz, which the constitutionalists controlled, with the support of the occupying United States Army. Diaz's army arrived at Mexico City shortly after Zapata with an even larger army. Both men rode in triumph after their hard-fought victory through the federal district to the presidential palace. 
Once inside the presidential palace, Zapata and Villa sat down to work out their alliance against the remaining Karenzistas. It was decided that Zapata would secure the eastern portion of Morelos, from Puebla to Veracruz. During the ensuing engagements, Zapata became frustrated with Villa, about the arms and ammunitions he was promised. And when Villa did supply Zapata's forces, it was too little to meet his battlefield needs. As a result, after taking Puebla, Zapata turned his attentions to reorganizing the state of Morelos. Leaving a small garrison behind, he began enacting his plan de Ayala. He and the Zapatistas began his land reform plan, redistributing land, opening of a rural loan bank, enabling the peasants to purchase farmland and the rebuilding of Morelos that had been devastated by Huerta's forces. Carranza decided to take advantage of Zapata's withdrawal and ordered General Obergon to lead his constitutionists' army to annihilate Villa's forces. He also had an advantage, with the United States still in occupation of Veracruz and in favor of Carranza, supplied him with munitions. Villa's reputation and the strength of his combined northern army outmanned the forces of Carranza. It wasn't clear what would be the final outcome of the impending hostilities. The fighting continued until April of 1915, when Villa's forces met Obergon's constitutionists at the Battle of Salea. Villa employed the same tactics he had used throughout the revolution. But his cavalry-style charges were no match for the machine gun fire inflicted on his troops and the modern military tactics used by Obergon's constitutionists. On the 15th, with his forces torn and shredded, he retreated to the north. While Villa retreated to the north with what was left of his army, Obergon took possession of the capital city from the Villas, who swiftly retreated to the city of Toluca. The situation seemed right for Carranza to make his move into Morelos against Zapata. Zapata recognizing the impending assault, attacked with large forces, which served to hampering the Carranzistas' pursuit of Villa into the northwest. Even though Zapata captured many of the key positions, Zapata's forces could not retain them and were eventually pushed back in retreat. Then in that October, the United States officially recognized Carranza and his government, and Carranza as president of the ruling faction of Mexico. Once obtaining diplomatic legitimacy, Carranza renamed the Constitutionist Army, the Mexican National Army, and began importing arms from the United States. Pancho Villa had suffered the loss of the greater part of his army at the Battle of Salea. His supplies and ammunition were rapidly diminishing. He was also less than pleased with the United States' material support of Carranza's National Army. When once it was Villa's forces that had the favor of the United States in both support and armaments. He decided to cross the border with 100 men into New Mexico on March 9, 1916, to raid the American garrison in the town of Columbus, where Villa engaged the United States 13th Cavalry in fierce battle, killing some troopers who managed to inflict heavy losses upon Villa's men. Villa's men raided the town and made off with horses, mules, and munitions after then setting it on fire. The news of the raid spread widely throughout the United States, and an anti-Mexican mentality was being fostered by the American newspaper's sensational exploitations of the event. President Wilson, who declared Villa a bandit and murderer, decided to send General John Pershing into Mexico to capture Villa. On March 14, 1916, Pershing entered into Mexico with a force of 100,000 troops to lead the punitive expedition of the U.S. Army. Dia, with a greater command of the terrain, fled to the mountains in avoidance of a frontal confrontation. From there, he employed guerrilla tactics against the pursuing forces. The relationship between the United States and Mexico was beginning to deteriorate. Tensions were rising between Washington and the Mexican government of Carranza. Despite the size of the U.S. Army, Villa's harassments and minor skirmishes with the American troops 
frustrated Pershing's operations. Empty-handed, on February 17, Wilson ordered him back across the Mexican border in defeat, as the United States' involvement in the First World War was fast approaching on the horizon. On February 17, with both Villa to the north and Zapata rising up in the south, and also to better relations with the United States. Carranza's government drafted and published the Mexican Constitution of 1917, promising a declaration of rights, federalism, the separation of powers, a representative government, constitutional remedies for all, along with land reform. After its publication, most of the warring factions laid down their arms, with even many of the past revolutionaries entering various government positions. As expected, Carranza was in no hurry to enact the promises of the new constitution, and both Villa and Zapata were not ready to give up their opposition. Villa, mostly diminished in the eyes of the government to a mere bandit, continued his struggle against Carranza. But from Carranza's point of view, Zapata posed the greater threat. His popularity in Morelos, despite the new constitution, enabled him to muster his Zapatistas to attack Carranza's federal army, enacting various limited engagements. Zapata needed to strengthen his forces. He enlisted with the aid of the Northern Liberal Revolutionary Felix Diaz, leader of the Felizistas forces, to join in the struggle against Carranza. In the fall of 1917 Carranza's forces, led by General Pablo González launched a major offensive against Zapata's combined forces in Morelos. González conducted a brutal assault on the towns and citizens of Morelos, as he captured Cuautli, Zacualpan, and Honacotapac. In November of 1918, with the end of the First World War, Zapata was concerned that the United States would return to Mexico, forcing the Zapatistas to join the Carranzistas in defense of the nation against foreign domination by the United States. He sent envoys to the Wilson administration, seeking aid and support, but the United States was not interested in Zapata or his cause. Carranza decided it was time to eliminate Zapata once and for all. In December of 1919, he ordered General González to move in with great force to conquer the rest of Morelos. He succeeded in capturing most of Morelos, though Zapata still held Tlaltizapan under his control. General González ordered Jesus Guajardo to mount a campaign against Zapata's Zapatista's forces in the mountains surrounding Guadalajara only to find that Guajardo had disgraced himself with his misdeed in a local cantina. Gonzalez had Guajardo arrested to be tried for the scandal he created. On March 21, Zapata attempted to smuggle a note to Guajardo, inviting him to join forces. Gonzalez's men intercepted the note, which ended up in the hands of Gonzalez. Gonzalez threatened Guajardo with a court-martial and execution, then he offered Guajardo a solution to his dilemma. He instructed Guajardo to send a note to Zapata offering to ally himself to the Zapatistas along with his forces and supplies. Zapata responded back to Guajardo on April 1, agreeing to Guajardo's offer. Zapata believed that Guajardo forces should mutiny on April 4 against the forces loyal to Carranza and the Zapatistas that had joined with the Carranzistas. On April 9, Gonzalez staged a mock battle and had all the traitorous Zapatistas shot dead. Convinced of Guajardo's sincerity, despite the warnings of those around him, Zapata agreed to meet with Guajardo. Guajardo invited Zapata to meet with him on April 10, 1919, at the Hacienda de San Juan, in Chinameca. Guajardo's men were waiting in ambush and when Zapata arrived, they opened fire on him riddling him with gunfire. He was killed instantly. And the photo of his dead body was circulated throughout Mexico as proof of his demise. In the aftermath of the brutal assassination of Zapata, 
the weakened Zapatistas continued their opposition to Carranza. As a result of his killing, Carranza and Gonzalez were suffering a decline in the support of the Mexican people as the 1920 elections were approaching. Alvaro Obregón, with his own ambitious interest in mind, decided to challenge his former allies by entering the race as a candidate for the presidency against Gonzalez. He knew that as Carranza's candidate, the peasants would vote against Gonzalez. With limited fighting continuing, Obregón engineered a coup with former constitutionalists against Carranza. Forcing Carranza, in May of 1920, to flee the capital towards Veracruz. Obregón, whom after the election, obtained the presidency. Although Zapata's involvement in the revolution and politics of Mexico lasted only 13 years, from his election of president of the village council at the age of 19, to his assassination just shy of his 49th birthday, his legacy lives on to this very day. His visionary ideals expressed in his plan of Ayala were finally enacted, along with other reforms, by President Lazaro Cardenas into the Mexican Constitution of 1934. Unique in its ideals and proposals, the plan of Ayala influenced future revolts in Europe and Central and South America. He is remembered as a visionary, as a man who fought for the liberties and emancipation of the severely impoverished people of Mexico. His influence can be felt to this day in the politics of activist movements in Mexico. In Cuautla where he was laid to rest, a monument stands today. And every year there are festivals held on the anniversary of his death to honor his legacy as the true visionary and architect of the Mexican Revolution.